Hi, everybody. Welcome to the March 1st, 2023 Brookline School Committee Finance Subcommittee. Um, we're going to start with um, the, let me find now, the agenda. So the first item on the agenda is approval of minutes from February 8th, 2023. Those are in the packet. Um, I'm going to make a motion for the minutes. Is there a second? Thank you, Nancy. Suzanne, hello. How do you vote? I'm staying, I wasn't here. Okay, Andy? Yes. Nancy? Yes. And I vote yes. Um, next item on the agenda is acceptance of gifts and grants. Um, if we'll start with the gifts, um, there's some very nice gifts um, from Mahanayam, which is the Thai restaurant for some um, gift cards for the bead event um, from Baffin for the um, funds for the AAPI book collection. Um, that they had raised um, for $4,540 um, and Lawrence PTO for $1,433 um, to support the middle school play and um, to fund a nurse to attend their um, farm school overnight. Um, so any questions on those? Go ahead, Nancy. Oh, oh, it was a middle school play. I thought for some reason th there was a there was a lot of middle school activity of the middle school play. Okay, sorry. I thought there was like an inter-school dance and I almost got excited. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's for Clyde Rex. Idea. That's the raft dances, that, which I've been actually wondering about. Raft dances haven't right re recommenced. But anyways, um, okay, can I get a motion for the acceptance of the gifts? Thank you, Andy. Who's, and I'll have Nancy as my second. So mm -hmm. Suzanne, how do you vote? Yes, yes. Nancy? Yes. And Andy? Yes. And I vote yes. So thank you to our donors and grants now. Um, let me pull up the document. There's one, two, three, I believe, new grants. Um, and these are not just new for us to consider, but actually new to the district, as I understand. Um, and so there's one about thinking about what your post high school plan looks like. Um, the second one about hate crime prevention. And the third one is specifically um, Afghan um, refugee support for districts who have um, a threshold number of um, Afghan refugee students, which Brookline does. Those are all from DESI. Any questions on those? Go ahead, Stan. Yeah, I don't have a question. I just want to say thanks to Mindy for uh, going after the, the grant. Uh, that, I think that's just great. We have 10 Afghanistan students and she it was a non-competitive grant, but she had to apply, of course. And so anyway, thank you to Mindy for doing that. Great. Um, okay, wonderful. Uh, Helen, go ahead. Just a quick question. Did Were these posted somewhere? Because I didn't see these. They should have been in the packet that everybody got. There was an attachment for gifts and an attachment for grants. Okay, I'll, um, I'll check again. And they're also on the website, if for whatever reason yours is missing. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to make a motion for favorable acceptance. Do we have a second? Thank you, Suzanne. Nancy, how do you vote? Yes. yes. Taking, okay, Suzanne? Yes. Andy? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Um, next section of our meeting is um, FY 2024 user fees. Um, everybody got a attachment, an updated attachment earlier today from Betsy. And I'm now trying to find mine. Um, so I can pull that up. So there were a couple of changes that are worth talking about from last time. We can talk about everything, but a couple of things that are highlighted that are specific changes. Um, so we can actually walk through the whole document. So this is the first page. The one change on school lunch is there was a comment made from the PTOs um, that there is for students who are on free and reduced lunch, their free and reduced lunch only covers one lunch. And so um, they, if they choose to eat a second lunch because they're still hungry, they are then that they are charged that lunch. Um, and so there are students, and there was one school specifically cited who provided the data. There's thousands of dollars of um, school lunch um, charges accrued across these families who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, and so the um, suggestion here is to make a second lunch also free. This would not be covered under the um, under the meals waiver, which the Commonwealth is issuing now because that covers one lunch. This would be covered under the district's financial assistance policy. 
and financial assistance account. Suzanne, go ahead. So I'm just curious, is that a problem? I mean, will we have, do we have the money to cover that? Is that what, I don't know what kind of money we're talking about, but. Well, the one school that came up, I think it was FRR and FRR. Off the top of my head, I believe they had $4,500, these families, $4,500 in debt since the beginning of the year. Yeah. Um, we have, we can talk about what the, we're in a little bit, um, we're going to look at the non-personnel accounts and the topic of the financial assistance account um, budget will come up. Um, Ruth, do you want to, are you, you're here, right? I can't see the, I can't see anyone with the um, slide up. Is this something that you you are ready or available to comment on? the question of lunch balances? Um, well, we can cover it, but the way that it would have to be covered is that you cannot transfer money from the operating budget into the school lunch account. It would have to be by transferring charges made against the school lunch account to the operating budget. Okay. Uh, Helen? Can we, does, yeah, can does we, the operating... I'm sorry? Well, I just had a follow-up. Can, can this take oh, effect ahead. this year? I was just wondering what we're doing about this year's second lunch bills that are out there. I think separately we can we can vote to waive the lunch bills that are in existence for this year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that's thank a good you. point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Helen. So, is that correct, Ruth? I spoke out of turn. Is that correct, Ruth, that the school committee could vote to for those families to wipe that debt? Yes, the school committee can vote that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to make an, an, well, we, when we get to the end of this, let's make a motion so we can bring that to full school committee independent of this, because it's actually an independent thing. Go ahead, Helen. So the revolving account for, um, school lunches, does that have a positive balance and how much is in there? Ruth? It does have a positive balance. Um, I, I don't have the exact number right now that that's available. But it could at least cover the thousand dollars, I assume. This year, it could. Act, yes, it, would, it wouldn't be a problem at the minimum, and the extra lunches for the rest of. Uh, would we do extra and whatever else happened this year? Correct. Okay, I think I think you know obviously this should come from the the school lunch revolving fund. It makes sense. Maybe I think that it's in, the point of setting up the financial assistance account was so that we could start to track where things where we were waiving costs as well, opposed to be. just absorbing them into our general practice. So it's a way of us actually quantifying, but but we can leave that up to Ruth to tell us later on what the best way is to do it. Um, we don't have to figure it out right now. The point is we can figure out a way to cover it, whether it's through the revolver or through tr transferring charges. Um, Nancy, go ahead. And it sounds like a, a dumb question, but this is across all schools that have a balance, correct? Correct. Oh, okay. And so it was brought up by one PTO. We have we done this in the past? We haven't. We, we, we did we forgive haven't. old debt, like multi-year old debt a couple of years ago, but I don't think we've done this second lunch free thing. Oh, um, yeah. and, and could this be old debt as well in this thousands of dollars? No? No. Okay. Re regardless, this is a good idea and I will vote positively for this. So thank okay. you for this. Okay. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that we're discussing all of the fees you see here too. So this is a to change, but if you have comments on other fees here that you want to bring up, feel free. Go ahead, Helen. Helen, I'm going to make you a member of this committee. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I actually, I didn't have a comment. I mean, that was from the last comment, but I just, you know, the one thing that we always think about when we raise the fees on meals is do we then end up you know, not having kids, having kids bring lunch instead of, uh, when does it become that it's so much that it's not worth it for the families to to buy the lunch? Um, so I think we just need to keep that in mind, uh, but that's all. Thank you. Um, next question, and there's no change on the BEEP dollar amounts. And so there's the 12 to 10 here, which was recommended by ANF, which is a three and a half percent increase. And if you all recall at our last meeting, we've talked about there's this would be a one year program with the idea we we're going to in the future, the two years from now, we'll be going to a full day program. And so that would change again. Um, no changes to base from our discussions last time. No changes to um, this materials to be presented, but I'm going to pull up some some material here because we had one of the questions we had last time was about um, the um, 
the increases for materials fee compared to the increases of educating a child. So I'm going to stop sharing this for one moment and I'm going to pull up some data um, for us to consider. So bear with me while I explain this chart. Can you see this Is it coming through? OK, yes. So what you see is this is the data, the column E is the total expenditures for pupil, which is the data that's certified by the state, um, by DESE. And um, the last year that DESE has available to us is the 2021 school year, um, because this past year, the ending in June 30th, 2022, they're still processing that data. And then we don't have future years yet at all. Um, and then what you see in column B is the materials fee tuition by year. You can see the current year is this 3219. We're discussing the 2324 data. And you can see the rate, um, the, the dollar amount that was voted each year by the school committee. Again, we're in the TBD for the upcoming year. And you can see this actually should be TBD also. Um, and then you can see the percent discount for the second, um, or they'll say the other children. Um, and What's interesting to compare here is if we look at the year in question, so for example, 2014, 2015, and because our data has a three year lag in it, so if we compare, say, this red box to this red box, which is the three year lag, the tuition, the materials fee tuition as a percentage of the total expenditures is 15.43%. And you can actually see what that looks like again because there's a three year um, lag because we're talking about a future year and then we have earned the current year and then we have to go back a year to get the um, data from DESE. So when you actually look at that over time, the hist the average, the historical nine year average um, is about 15 and a half percent. Which actually makes sense as we think about, you know, this idea of materials fee and our staff costs versus the actual materials costs. Um, and so if we were to apply, again, thinking about the most recent data we have um, and using that historical average, the tuition for materials fee should be the 3,970. I'm putting that data there. And I'm just also provided the data, the ANF proposed three and a half percent increase, which is $3,332. Andy? Uh, just noticing that the three, the like the year you'd be using to calculate that, uh, saw a, a really, really large jump, right, in the average expenditure. So it's not a typical year at all. Right, and if in a future year, um, it doesn't exactly. It, it's, and if in a future year, um, we saw a redu uh, a change again, that would be reflected as well. Like if, for example, next year we have a much smaller, because we had a large increment this year, and then next year we find that the increment's much smaller, then in a future year, that same small increment would be reflected. So what is being proposed? Well, it's up to the committee to decide what's being proposed. Um, I think that if we go off of the historical average of what the um, actual materials fee costs um, have been, then we should go towards the $3,970 number. And what kind of a jump is that? What, I mean, in terms that of be? that would Percent be, increase. it would be about $750 and it would right. be 23% increase. Ooh. Is some of that 25 such a big jump because of um, ARPA money? No. Nope. And COVID money? It has to do um, with the number of students in the system and the total expenditures. So the per pupil expenditures, there are fewer pupils. Oh, because that's the year we lost close to 1,000 students, but we still ran the system kind of Correct. as before. Right. It just seems like a, a, a difficult year to base a, a tuition increase off of, you know, three years down the road when it's no longer seems so relevant. And in a year, though, and I can see what your point is, and in, a, and in this year, we might find, oh, um, and so we might choose to short that, and then we might come back to this in a year, like we might again compare it, um, thinking about the um, if if as your point is, like you can see that the year to year change is smaller. 
and once this number is final, it's a smaller number, then we can adjust it again next year to again represent that fraction. It would just be that we would have mitigated the amount one year and brought it back a following year yeah. to sort or, of soften could, that change over time. But we could also base it on average of three years, you know, some of some three years rather than on a, a particular year right, that happens to be three years previous, just to soften the effect of these fluctuations. The problem is that we don't have the data for anything more recent than 2021. Right, and my understanding, and Ruth, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that we don't have an anticipation of DESE releasing the, the um, FY22 data anytime soon. It takes quite some time, and, it, and it's just submitted relatively recently to them. Yeah, the end of the year state report is due um, in early October, but then it goes through it goes through an audit process by each individual city and town. Ours went through the audit in January, but then the Department of Ed goes through another audit process that they use and they allow districts, if there's any corrections that need to be made almost a, an entire school year before they then close it out and start doing their calculations. So it'll be a while. Okay, thank you. Helen? I don't know if you want an opinion or not. The uh why don't okay. I get the opinions from the subcommittee first, okay, because fine. you're going to get the chance to do your opinions also at full committee. Okay, I can be quiet. <laughs> subcommittee? Yeah. Go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah, I just, I, I that 3,900 just feels like too big a jump for me. Uh, if we can not do that, I'd be much happier. 23% okay. or whatever you said feels like a huge jump, even I understand how we got there, but... Um, you know, at 32, at 3,300, you're saying it's close to 3,000. When you start to say 39, it's 4,000. That feels like a really big jump. Um, Andy? So. Okay, thanks. Andy, I saw your hand was up, or did I misunderstand? No, I was just oh. uh, clutching my forehead. Oh. <laughs> Nancy, do you want to make any comments? I, 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 Suzanne, I hear you. And perhaps the idea of, of an average is a good idea. I, I just think that, I mean, there, there's just so much controversy over this whole thing too. We didn't come to this number lightly, did we, Mariah? I mean, the number, no. I feel like the number is the number. I also think though it is a significant one year jump. And I think that we could choose something in the middle of these two and yeah. look at how we see the, our pupil expenditure is evolving um, once we get the next year number and see how we want to mitigate it because I don't want people to be horrified by a one year number. Oh, but I the agree. reality I agree. is, yeah, but the reality is that like we do have costs and we are under yeah. financial pressure and we want to, you know, offer a tremendous benefit, but we also need to recognize and we're going to have this conversation in multiple times because when we're talking about charging fees. Um, we need to recognize the actual costs of what's going on. And there are actual costs to providing materials. So Andy, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I do think that people have made major life decisions based on a reasonable expectation of not having a sudden raise of this magnitude. Um, I just don't think it would be fair to families who have kind of been counting on this uh, to suddenly raise it by so much for what to me seems like a fairly abstract uh, reason. So I'm gonna move 3,500 um and the 10 percent discount for additional children what is 3500 come to what kind of what what jump is that uh let's see it's probably somewhere around the 18 percent. i'm guessing <laughs> a dollar thank you <laughs> <laughs> it's 8.7 percent oh eight. Oh boy was i off <sighs> oh, okay and again i i'm i'm all in support of teachers and bringing their kids. I love the materials we program. I do. And I, I, I just don't understand why we came up with the 38 without some kind of random calculation. So, you know, 3,500 sounds right to me, but you need to tell, I, you know, I'm new at this. So is that not enough? Like is, is 10% a, a better number? I don't, I don't know. The historical number you can see is between two and 3%. Yeah, no, I but I think that. it's been lagging, as we can see. Anyway, I made okay, a motion. 30, Do we have a? Sounds pretty good to me. Okay. That sounds pretty good. Is there a second to thirty five hundred? Because we can't vote on it to move ahead. Okay, Nancy, thank you. Andy, how do you vote? No. Nancy. Yes. Suzanne. Um, I'll vote no. 
Okay, so I will vote yes. And so does it fail? It fails, right? If it's a tie vote, it fails. I think you just report it as a tie vote and say this it was. That's fine. Let's just do that. And we can go ahead with um, the rest of the conversation. Um, unless anyone else wants to propose a different um, amount. Let me see. Um, yeah, we'll make it David's problem at full committee. I'm trying to find the. <laughs> so this will go to this, the full committee with no particular recommendation. For this particular one. And should correct. we attempt to find a consensus uh, that, that at least three of us could support in order to recommend something? Or do we want the full committee to have this conversation again? Well, last year we had the full conversation again about this particular topic anyway. So I kind of just want to cut to the chase and not do it twice. OK. Yeah. Um, so if we're, we're going to, we're going to. OK. Um, going back to the user fees, um, so we talked about materials fee just now. Um, so here's the question on Sevis. We had there was this original idea of twenty four thousand three thirty five. Um, Donna got the data that the cost for us to be reissued to be dis, become certified to do this I twenties is three thousand. Um, we also need this service thing to do the China exchange program. However, it's irrelevant right now because the China exchange program is not planned for the this upcoming year anyway. Um, so we so the only question is, do we want to do this? And when Anthony checked, he said basically like, no, we don't need to do this. We there is like a dollar amount here. I was looking. I thought it was ridiculous that we're offering like a very very cheap thing, and I thought we could increase that. Certainly, we want to increase it to at least more than our most recent all funds um, amount of what it's actually cost, 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 costing to um, educate a student. But right now, it sounds like it's a non-issue since they don't. The high school is saying don't renew the membership for now. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, Excuse me. I would only worry uh, if if it, there's an entrance fee to be re recertified are we to there is an entrance fee but they're saying don't pay for it now anyway okay. the high school is saying don't even pay for it because it's okay. not they're okay. not doing it either way um lost books the reason that the title's title highlighted is because it's come up that there's other things getting lost for example now that we're in the laptop model like chargers and stuff and so there's a I think staff is going to recommend to us to possibly change the title of this program to be more inclusive of not just books but other things that are lost that need to get replaced. Um, so more on that, but not right now. Um, no changes on middle school. Um, the only, oh, athletics. We had a discussion about athletics, if you recall last time. Um, athletics basically said um, they need a lot more info and they really do wanna go back to this review, um, have the review so they can understand much better the finances of what's going into athletics in terms of revenues and expenditures and what they should be paying for that they're not, as we talked about, um, for example, custodial and additional security for some of these events. Um, so unless there's someone on the committee who wants to go ahead with the $311 or some other amount, I'm okay with leaving it at $300 for now, letting them go through their review and then coming back to it once we have a much better sense of the needs um, from this review. Does anyone on the subcommittee disagree? Does anyone want to increase the fees or are we good with waiting like they've asked? Go ahead, okay Susan. Waiting. Yeah, I'm okay with waiting. I just wondered at what point do they need to know the fees? When do they start collecting them? They collect them all year round. Oh, they collect them in, yeah, because they collect them in like- For each season, for each exactly. sport. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but this but would sorry. be only in, a, in effect for um next the year fall. and then right and then we would be only talking about a future fees for the following fall go ahead okay. helen so have we been able to implement the online payment not yet they're doing the whole um they were vetting the vendor still right at our and last we will meeting. have that in place for next year ruth do you know if actually I um kyle has done some additional legwork for us and we are moving forward with my school bucks um i gave kiana and Donna, that information, I guess it was earlier this week or last week, I can't remember when, um, but because it, we've had uh, my school bucks in the past, so some people are familiar with it. And in addition to that, Kyle has confirmed that we can do refunds through my school bucks and it doesn't have to involve the town. So that's a huge savings in terms of time and, and manpower. Will it be ready for spring semester um, payments or will it only be ready for fall? 
I'm I'm hoping for spring, but I'll have to get an update from Kiana. I ask her to keep me updated as to how it's progressing. It seems like it's a fairly straightforward and easy thing to get implemented. Thanks. That's great news. So um, we may cover the increase just with that. Uh, well, you mean in terms of additional revenue collection? Additional revenue. If we're only collecting 75%, we collect 90% where we've made the difference. Could be. Um, summer school programs, when we talked about it a little bit more with Jen Martin, the originally this just said 415 and 465. What she clarified is that these are the pricings for the five the five week programs, and they're looking at some shorter programs, which they think might be attractive to students. And so we just included the word maximum here to make clear that if the, the programs would then be prorated by that two or three week amount instead of the full five week amount for the shorter programs. Go ahead, Helen. I'm sorry, I forget to bring down my hand. I'm sorry. Is that, that's an old hand? Okay. Yeah. Um, otherwise, these charges, none of those things have changed. We'll come back to school buildings in a minute. And then there's two actual areas that weren't set, that weren't included before because the um, academic testing fees actually isn't, it's not something that we set, but we're just including it because we actually charge it, even though it just is a straight pass through. It's set by the college board, so not by us. Um, we can't change those amounts. Um, and then the China exchange program, we're not collecting fees again for next year because the program won't continue, but we're just leaving it in there as a placeholder for the future. Um, so other than the building fees, which we can come back to, are people interested in voting at least these fees for now and coming back to the building fees? Is there anything that people don't feel comfortable with voting right now? Andy? Just a very general question. I, I remember that last year um, we had quite a bit of discussion about how much to raise beep tuition by. It became a kind of it went out to the philosophical plane, really, um, and we kind of eventually landed somewhere in the middle. Is it completely uncontroversial this year that it should be the three point five that that we're kind of doing across the board? It was until you brought it up. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering because it, it, it was controversial last year, and I'm it wondering was. why this year it just seems so like, so obvious. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, if I recall, we we had a conversation. The subcommittee voted one thing, and then the full committee voted something else. So we'll see what happens at full committee. I think Margaret's here. Um, Are you here, Margaret? I can't see you. I see her. Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Okay. How are you? Do you want to make any comments on the proposed tuition for next year, the twelve two ten? No, I think that, um, you know, I spoke with Ruth and um, and Dr. Guillory and you, and I think that that was the recommendation from admin and finance. I think last year, some of the controversy was just sort of still coming off of that pandemic year when we had reduced the size of the program to half of its capacity. And um, we were trying to figure out what would enrollment look like? Would we be able to re-enroll students? Would we land at a good spot? Um, so I think that this is, you know, this is an, you know, it's an increase, that's for sure. Um, and I think it's an acceptable increase if we're thinking that in the following year, which I know you all support, we're going to be a school day program. And so I think this is moving towards that um, and getting people thinking about that. So I, I don't know what the full school committee will vote, um, but this is what resulted from the conversations with um, Dr. Guillory and admin and finance. So thanks, Margaret. You're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna move favorable action of the document. Thank you, Andy, for what I presume is a second. Okay, Suzanne, how do you vote? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Andy? Yes. And I vote yes. I'm gonna make a second motion related to this, which is um, moving to have the full school committee consider um, applying this second lunch free policy retroactively for the current fiscal year. Is there a second? Thank you, Suzanne. Andy, how do you vote? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Nancy? I vote yes. Okay, great. Betsy, is that something that you can like, I don't know, I think it's too late for tomorrow, I guess, but maybe, is it too late for tomorrow to put that on the agenda, the docket? Um, let me do a little bit of checking and okay. um, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out and I'll let you know. Okay. If not, can we throw it on for the 16th? Absolutely. Yes. Or whenever Is that we're you're asking about Mariah? Not the fees, but the specific question of retroactively wiping out second lunch debt for free and reduced kids for the current fiscal year. 
Okay. Yeah. So if even if it has to wait till the sixteenth, um, that's fine. I think. Um, okay. So I'm going to take this document down, and we're going to go to. Let me talk a little bit about the next thing, which was um, building fees. Um, so building rental fees. I had a really nice meeting with um, the extended day directors yesterday. Um, I think maybe one or two is in the attendee list, so, um, which is great. Um, so I talked to them, of course, as you can imagine with the changes in the building rental fees, um, it's really important to them to part of their cost structure and they need to understand. Um, and so I came to their meeting and, and I talked about sort of the drivers that are going on in, in terms of having to, wanting to revisit this, talking about the financial um, crisis that PSB finds itself, the significant increase in the repair and maintenance and operating costs for the buildings that um, we are ourselves experiencing and how that's a large contributor to um, overall budget issues as well. Um, and also that, you know, it's important, we, as we were thinking about this, it was helpful to get better clarity around with fees being charged and why. They sent um, a really nice letter to me in advance of our meeting from yesterday talking about um, their suggestions for how we could possibly proceed. Um, and they actually suggested going back to um, a model that had been used in the past where they were charged on a per student basis as opposed to on a square footage basis or on a room, an hourly rate um, basis. In addition to that, we talked about um, things, and I think that they understood those issues that I brought up before about our need, and they um, understood that there's a, a need to pay more. They also shared the expectations of um, expecting to have some guarantees around space sort of um, minimums availability so that they're, they have a more consistent um, experience as a building user as well, which made a lot of sense, right? Because we want our students after school um, to have um, a really strong experience and, and, and have that the staff working those programs also be able to succeed in, in what they're trying to do. Um, so I'm gonna pull up a new chart, which you all haven't seen which um, looks at some of the different costs going on with building rental fees only related to the extended days. We haven't um, changed or discussed any of the other um, any of the other fees like for base or Brookline Music School or any of the other renters. This is strictly related to extended days. So. Um, can you see that? It's a little small. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so basically, um, the the this is the FY23 actual data. And so each one of the programs provided their operating budget to me. Um, and we got the confirmation of the number of students that they're certified to um, to operate with, as well as their enrolled students. This is their actual rental fees that they've been charged for the current FY fiscal year, just as a point of reference and their, the square feet and the rate that that refers to, which isn't necessarily needed for this conversation, but you can see the percent, the, the rent as a percent of their revenue. So for most of them, it's we'll say it's an average of one and three quarters percent of their revenue. Um, and it ranges, you can see from program to program. Their proposal again was to go to a per student cost. And what I'm showing you here is um, if there's four different models here. So if we were to charge them $100 per student, 150, 200, or 250, and you can see what that does in terms of um, by program um, revenue that we would charge and the percent of their program cost that that would be. And we're just using FY23 numbers of students and budget, but it gives you a sense of the scale for future years. Um, so you can see that at $100 a student, it ends up at about, on average, it's on average around 2% of their program costs. At 150, as you would imagine, it's around 3%. At 200, it's around 4%. And at 250, it's around 5%. Um, and the other thing that we talked about with them as well 
um, or that I talked about with them that I've been thinking about was for their students who are on um, some sort of full or partial pay program. Um, so whether they're on scholarships offered by the extended day program or whether they're on a voucher program, which I believe one of our extended days um, does um, accept um, child care vouchers, state child care vouchers. So if they have um, that we would reduce the the um, rent um, fractionally. So for example, if if they had 2% of their total students by headcount were fractionally reduced, um, were, were not paying students, then their rent would be reduced by that amount. And so that's just really to en encourage them to not feel like they're incurring financial risk um, by providing those kinds of financial supports um, and to allow um, them to not be penalized by PSB for those. Um, so the, I guess the question to the committee is, um, and we're not going to vote this tonight, but the question to the committee is, how do you feel about this idea of a per student charge for the extended days going back to a prior model? And, and do you have some sense of um, the different rates and how you feel about them? And I leave it open to the committee. Go ahead, Suzanne. So um, I'm looking at the $100 per student. Uh, and so why would they want that if that actually is going to cost them more than the, the, what they're doing now? Well, they, they would love us to not charge them anything, Suzanne. The point is that we're asking for them to pay more because we are in a situation where our building expenses are significant and our overall oh, budget I thought, needs I thought they said if they're going to have to have a fee, they wanted a per student cost. Like They, they have a fee already. They have a fee already, and they're asking for the model to be changed from a square footage charge to a per student charge. We had proposed going from per square foot to hourly, and they're saying, don't make it hourly, make it by student. Right, but why don't, okay. Because we won't stick with the square footage? Why, they wouldn't, Correct. they would want the square footage, right? They, You're saying they, you don't want the square footage, so they said, okay, then do the per student. The, the idea for the getting rid of the square footage is, well, we still have to put some guardrails on minimums and maximums of square footage, A, because EEC requires 35 square feet Per child anyway. So that's a minimum. And when we de-link square footage from the rental lease, we also need to set a maximum because we don't want a program to say, okay, well, I need, you know, twice as many classrooms as I needed last year when you were asking me for, right? So we need to put some guardrails on it, but they were asking for this per student cost. So that's why, and I'm, I think it's a different way to consider the problem. And to their point, it scales with the number of students in their program. If they have fewer students that they can accept, then it's fewer, like, so it becomes smaller for the programs which can accept fewer students. And it becomes and there, greater for the programs who can accept more. Is it, do any of our extended day programs have dedicated space at this point, or is everybody uh, sharing space with classrooms that are existing during the day? Matt, do you wanna answer that question? Are you there, Matt? I could answer it. Go but ahead, Helen. I'm pretty sure the only thing that they have dedicated is an office in every school. Um, we used to have dedicated spaces right. and that went out when our population went up. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, some storage space slash office space at, at a couple of schools and uh, uh, some basement space at Lawrence and Baker that isn't really used for anything else by the schools that uh, we leave for the extended day, folks. Okay, thanks. Andy? I, I might have missed the answer to this earlier, but you know, the I, I, with this per square footage charge, I mean, it varies dramatically from school to school, what that rate is, and how is that negotiated uh, from one school to the next? Matt? So that was inherited. Um, they started charging in FY15, uh, sort of linked with the last uh, operational override. And they used a model that was a per pupil based model, but it took into account the number of uh, free and reduced students in the population, which didn't necessarily impact those enrolled in the aftercare program um, uh, that we borrowed from Newton. And then the committee wanted to sort of evolve it into a square footage amount uh, without drastically changing it. So we changed it via the CPI and just recorded the square footage amounts. But the, the big difference really came from 
you know, the initial startup. So you've got a school like Lincoln that would have had a, a higher free and reduced uh, lunch population than a than a Heath or a Ridley, and so their their uh, their amounts were different. So if we went to a per pupil scheme, would we need to take factors like that into account as well, rather than just you know? Well, I, it my proposal is yeah. my proposal does take it into account, but it actually. The thing that Matt's saying is that, for example, the Lincoln rate looked at the overall school's free and reduced lunch, but not the free and reduced population within that program. Mm -hmm. So it um, it doesn't address, the, the current calculation doesn't address who's actually attending extended day. Yeah. Right. And the new proposal would. I think for the executive extended day directors, uh, a flat amount per pupil is easier for them to track, which is why they'd be asking for it. And then they don't have to try to manage, do I want an extra classroom or two, or do I not, uh, based on what I'm being charged for it. Helen? You're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, this flat charge seems much more equitable to me and between the schools and having that piece where if kids are on scholarship, we take that into account, I think, you know, adjusts for what we need to adjust for. So I, I think this makes sense. Okay. So I'm not going to ask the subcommittee. Oh, go, go ahead, Carolyn, and then we'll finish this up. Sorry, do you, do you not want Go ahead, quick comment, okay. because we're not going to take a vote tonight. This is like socializing it tonight, so I'm happy to hear comments. Okay, I'll try to be quick. So I think at a previous meeting, a recent previous meeting, you showed the whole building expenses. Yep. Um, and that was interesting to see. I would have liked to have seen sort of like a an some sort of like audit or income and expenses in terms of where all that money goes to show that all the incoming building fee money, sort of how that gets spent. Um, and I seem to recall there was some conversation about who gets charged and who doesn't get charged. And like, I think somebody said, oh, do we want to consider base a partner, a community partner, and therefore not charge them? So I guess I just would say to, sorry, throw a, a wrench in this. Um, I see extended day as a, as a social safety net. Um, I think, you know, childcare is really important. And um, so we're talking about probably five through 11 or 12 year olds who really need, um, working families need their kids to be cared for. So <laughs> I see this as an extension of, PSB's mission. I see um, after school care as an extension of, of who PSB puts their arms around. Um, so I'm I'm sorry to see um, the potential for charging the after school programs more for using our buildings. Um, that feels directionally not, not uh, positive. To my mind, um, we we there's an override proposal. At one moment, there was a proposal to to add um, six hundred thousand dollars to extend the beep day, um, and we all love beep and we all love um, early childhood education, but it's not actually within the core mission of the PSB. So yes. I'd be more interested in investment um, in in our enrolled students, and I, I think after school care is is really important. Thank you. As I mentioned, this is not gonna be coming up for discussion tonight or for vote tonight. This is the first view of one of what the, the extended day suggested. Helen, do you have like a two second yeah, comment just on it? Okay. One comment about what Carolyn said. Uh, you know, I agree that this is an important program. Uh, BEEP is part of the school system. It is required that we provide special education for uh, uh, three or three to five year olds within a uh, inclusive setting. So it's not optional, uh, Carolyn. I just wanted you to be aware of that, and anybody else who's listening. Thank you, Helen. And I think Matt, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, the funds that are used out of the this covers directly custodial costs for the buildings. So just so you know, that's yeah. where the, these costs are going to. Is it offsets a small fraction 
of custodial costs, yeah. which are related to the, the operations of all of these um, programs as well and directly support them. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that. We're going to get to next item on the agenda, which is the um, non-personnel account review. And I'm going to turn it over to Ruth for the presentation. Thank you, Linus, for pulling up the slides. Is it is it Ruth who's giving the presentation or you, Linus? It's Ruth, correct? I'm going to give the presentation, but Linus is running my slides. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So tonight, on behalf of the school administration, I'm going to present the, the FY24 uh, non-salary budget ex, uh, ex, expense, non-salary budgets. Um, and this is only for the school committee operating budget. It doesn't include the revolving accounts or the grants. And the grants, so it's just sort of comment on it. Grant expenditures are basically restricted and they are approved by the funding authority for the grants prior to any funds being approved. And as far as revolving accounts are concerned, a school committee votes to establish a revolving account for a specific purpose. And the revenue that is generated for those revolving accounts can only be expended for that specific pur purpose. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, so for example, you can't charge athletic fees to the school lunch account. So I wanna uh, just, also kind of say that the all of the um, school operating non-salary budgets were reviewed extensively by the senior leadership team in early December prior to finalizing the budget. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the budget process was this year. Not quite ready to go there in yet minus, but that's okay. Um, so the budget process began in October and we, we gave the budget managers um, their FY22 actual budget expenditures they received also the FY23 current year budget. And as of the date that it was supplied to them, we also gave them where they stood in terms of the actual expenditures to date and their encumbrances. And we provided them with some guidance as to uh, budgeting for FY24. All of them were told that they were starting with a zero base. So there was no guarantee of any budget amount as a starting point. We asked them to assume that there was going to be an increase in enrollment K-12 of approximately 250 students and recommended that they look at a 5% increase in expenses. But I also ask all of them to check with some of their larger vendors of people that they use uh, most frequently to check, and most of them have good relationships with sale people, to check um, what might be coming down the pike in terms of salary increases, but not salary increases, I'm sorry, pricing increases uh, for the upcoming year. Now, a lot of our budget managers did in fact do that and found that the 5% was not needed. And so their increases were lower than that. This is the first year that our budget managers have been asked to build a budget that complies with how we have to report our instructional expenses to the Department of Ed on our end of the year report. Expenses have to be reported at the school level, which is new for Brookline. They have not done that, although this has been a requirement since ed reform went into place. So this has been a, a little bit of a, I think, culture shift for some of our budget managers, and they weren't they were uncertain as to how to proceed, but we I think we're getting them there. Okay, Linus, you can slip now. <laughs> Again, to align with the um end of the year reporting. These are the major budget categories that we use when we have to um, report our expenditures at the end of the year. And I did, as I said, include for comparison purposes under FY23, the asterisks are those portions of the instructional operations and the out-of-district tuition and transportation budgets that were partially funded in FY23 with ARPA funds. And flip, Linus. And this just is a graphic representation of the um, information on the prior page. Okay, Linus. Now, within each of the major budget categories, there are expense categories. Again, these line up with how our information is reported on the end of the year state report. So as you can see, there's supplies and material, contracts, other expenses, expenses, utilities, fringe benefits, and capital. 
Central Carolinas. <clears throat> and just to give a um, sort of brief recap of what all of these are, supplies and materials are fairly evident. Those are items that are consumed often during the course of a single fiscal year. Um, paper, photocopier supplies, things of that nature, outside service contracts. Outside services and contracts are services rendered by non-personnel that are not on this on, on staff, not on payroll. So cleaning services, special education therapy and medical services, legal services. It also would include things such as photocopier maintenance and leases, our transportation contracts, and probably the largest expense in that category would be our out-of-district tuitions. Then other expenditures, which typically are the non-tangible things, mileage, dues, conferences, meals, and receptions. <clears throat> Excuse me, utilities, which again, pretty self-evident, um, cell phone and wireless services and our data communications. Fringe benefits, which is a very small portion of it, which is basically the LTD, LTD insurance, which is provided to the senior level staff. And then capital equipment, which is defined as um, durable items with a useful life of greater than one year. Now included in there is the technology leases, which seems like it wouldn't make sense to some degree, but under the Department of Ed reporting requirements, they do consider technology, capital, technology leases as capital equipment. So to just go over now again, the major sort of budget category is administration, and then these are our expense categories. And I just did Ruth, can I interrupt just to ask, do you want us to hold our questions to the end or should we ask you as as it goes along? What I prefer that you hold to the end. Okay, unless we have something where it's like a quick clarification, we'll hold to the end. Thank you. Um, so just a quick comparison. So under the major uh, uh, the major budget category is administration, and here's our different expense categories. And just some of the variances are, are, are the uh, outside service contracts is there was a reduction for the audit um, costs, which had been carried several years at $17,000, and the actual expense is closer to eight. And so that there's a reduction there. Other expenses, um, and this is one of the things that you had talked about earlier, was the financial assistance that has been budgeted as 175,000. I reduced it to 40, which um, uh, may be too much, but in light of the the school lunch, second free school lunch, it may not be too much, but I still think it would be sufficient to cover that. As you can see, the actual for FY22 is just over $2,500. And as of today, the year to date is just over $2,400. And then there's also a reduction in fringe benefits. And quite honestly, that's just because in, in building the FY23 budget, that amount was double budgeted. So some of the things that are included under an administration for the outside services and contracts, that's the legal contract that we have for legal services. It includes advertising costs. There's um, some budget for some uh, consulting for mentoring and coaching of new senior level staff. And there's also funds in there to provide some additional support for our uh, student management system, student manage, uh, Aspen student management system. Okay, Linus, thank you. Um, now in the instructional costs, again, um, so in FY23, some of those costs are being supported through ARPA funds. Excuse me, I am losing my voice. <clears throat> so the um, outside services and contracts, you, the photocopier leases and maintenance contracts in prior years, including FY23, have been split between the high school photocopier, um, the copy center, and the um, technology budget. And those have been pulled out of those and moved to a new cost center in the operations account, which is where it's more appropriately, where it is reported from and where it's more appropriately carried. But there, that money that was off, that was reduced in the instructional area has been offset by an increase in the athletic transportation. Now, in at the end of FY23, for reasons unknown, the former deputy moved the athletic transportation from their revolving account into the um, operating account. And so we're carrying that in that location for FY24. There are also some increases in the other expenses 
um, and that some of that is included as athletic officials. There's increases in the professional dues and memberships, and also a substantial amount of uh, funding has been increased for the educational uh, training and conference costs. There's also in this budget, oh, just that's fine, Linus, you can flip, I'll, but I'll just quickly say that we are not carrying at this point any funding for the replacement of projectors. I did have a conversation with uh, Fong at the end of January, I think it was the end of January, could have been the beginning of February, where she realized that she had not um, properly folded that into her request. But we are at this point, at the end of the second quarter and the end of the third quarter, we were projecting that there was going to be a surplus in the FY23 budget, and that that funding would then be forwarded to Fong so she could begin her, get back her um, projector replacement on track. Okay, Linus, thank you. Not under the operations budget, again, it's just the major budget categories, operations, and our individual expense categories. Um, under the outside services and contracts, that's where the new cost center, cost center, I'm sorry, was created for the photocopier leases and maintenance. So they're now all um, in one area and it more easily tra tracked. And also they have to be reported um, separately. Um, actually twice they're reported, but they, yeah, they, there's a very detailed reporting that has to be made for the, the contracts on the end of the report. Also in that area is our regular ed transport bus transportation contract is carried there. That contract is offset right now by a $48,000 user fee. And depending on what happens with the override, that user fee may or may not be forgiven. And there are, again, adjustments in some of the utility line items. And that basically is in the cell phone service that the budget has been way higher than what the actual need has been. So there's been some adjustments there in that category. And this is for our special education costs. And these are um, the costs for where there's outside contracts that are needed for some, some specific medical or therapy services that uh, cannot be provided by our own staff that they may be unique. But also included in this line item is the cost for special education settlements. So when, when there is a disputed um, IEP and, and, and we, we sort of settle with a parent and have a, a separate unique contract where a parent may place a child and then we reimburse a parent for that child's placement, that's considered a settlement. In prior years, that has been charged against the tuition account which um, it's not appropriately charged there. The Department of Ed has been very clear. It needs to be charged as a settlement and reported as a settlement. So that has been shifted um, into the outside services and contracts line item. And there's also, again, been some minor tweaks in the cost of the cell phones. So you'll see a reduction in that line item. And then the final one that we're looking at is sort of the bigger expense is the special education tuition and transportation um, budget. So I have shown here by the type of uh, program, uh, out of district program, the cost that we have budgeted for the current year budget and next year's budget. And then you'll see that the special tuition is supplemented this year by some ARPA funds. The tuition, the, the, this, whole section, but we use mostly the uh, circuit breaker for our tuition accounts. Um, so the, we have had an increase in our circuit breaker funding. So the 3.4 million that you see there is actual funds that we will receive during FY23 based on FY22 expenditures. And that is how the circuit breaker works. So that is actually real, real money that we will receive. And you'll see that there is that reduction there. Ruth, will you will you restate that again, please? So the circuit breaker, the three point four seven five that you see for circuit breaker is our funds that we will receive during FY twenty three that are being applied to reduce the FY twenty four budget, and that is based on our special education costs from FY twenty two. So we actually have to 
fill out a form and apply for that circuit breaker funding, which is done in June. And it's based on uh, costs for out of, it's the majority of our, our costs come from our out of district costs for our out of district tuitions, but there are some students who are in district who qualify. Um, in order to qualify, the, the cost by each child has to exceed four times the um, foundation budget cost in order to qualify for the for the reimbursement. So that's the money there. The one thing is that in prior years, there was a $475,000, excuse me, uh, contingency that had been budgeted under the special tuition. And in the prior two years, that the funding has not been used and we deliberately did not include it in the FY24 budget because we know that the, there's the we're facing an override and we didn't want to put something in that it did not appear that we were going to need. And it looks like this will be sufficient based on what we have. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned this or not. I don't have the breakdown of the number of students by each of these placements, but I did go back and look and the average um, out of the average number of students placed out of district between FY22, FY 20, 21, and 22 is actually 76. Our, our out of district placements have been fairly consistent over the prior three years. And then just the last slide is just a graphic. Um, just Hang on one second, Ruth. Val, is your question just a clarification or is it an actual question? I think it's a clarification, I hope. Um, on the circuit breaker fund, Ruth, the number for FY 24, are you utilizing what we anticipate a fully um, a fully funded student opportunity act will be or not that not. that is money that is a red that the fy24 money is funds that we will receive in fy23 it is part of the fy23 state budget 23 okay. or 24 um it so the 3.475 we yep. will receive in fy 23. It is part of the FY23 budget. We are actually starting to receive those funds now. And it's for expenditure in FY24 relating calculated off of FY22? Correct. Okay. Correct. And so the money that we have this year, the 3.1, those are funds that we received last year based on FY21. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then the, just the last slide is just a graphic. Um, of the, the of the uh, special out of district tuition and transportation costs, and you can see there's really not much of a difference. It's fairly um, fairly consistent in terms of the breakout, uh, but there there is that increase, which is kind of difficult to see in the uh, circuit breaker funding. Why is the circuit breaker funding, which is a revenue source, on the same table as the expenditures, or am I misunderstanding something? It's it's an offset to your expenditures. But isn't it going to those other categories? Isn't it already being like, isn't it contributing to in some fraction to special transportation and to those other categories? It's just showing you your total cost. So when you factor in your circuit breaker, this is your total cost. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, hang on one second, Helen. <clears throat> We're going to take questions from the subcommittee. Really? Nancy, Andy, Suzanne? Nothing yet? Well, I can Ruth start. did a good job. Thanks, yeah, Ruth. I, <laughs> I'm going to... Thank gonna, you. I'll ask a couple of questions if that's okay, Ruth, and then we can open it up. Hang on, David, a little bit, and then we'll come to you. Um, and and Ruth, just to confirm for people, if if there's questions that they that aren't able to be answered tonight, we can bring those back at the next meeting, right? With a little more detail, if there's anything you don't have at hand, is that sure. correct? Okay. Um, I wanted to say that I appreciated the analysis of the financial assistance and um, and it's. And to me, the reduced pickup, like the reduced use or the low use of it so far probably speaks to people 
short, like basically not collecting funds or not attributing funds correctly. And, and I know Donna and I talked about that recently. Yeah. Um, and so that'll be something which I think it's good that you left a cushion still because I think it's clear that people just aren't, they're not charging it correctly yet because it's a new process. Um, so I'm glad you left 40,000 in there, even though the pickup so far is less than $3,000 um, for the past two years. Um, my question, is for the outside services and contracts, you mentioned that you reduced the audit from 17 to eight, but the overall um, administration, um, thank you for scrolling backwards, Linus. The overall administration, outside services and contracts um, is much larger. And I was curious specifically for external consultants, um, if you could provide to us just what the um, expected um, external consultants would be for FY24 and it doesn't need to be now but just knowing what that what that looks like would be helpful um I just I just want to like when you so it, it as I said it includes it's actually lower next year mm -hmm. um, but like so I presume that includes things like panorama or other am I right that that includes administration I don't know what's in there and I guess I'm just curious as to what's in the contracts for administration okay so it includes legal services. Yep. Which is a it's close to I can't remember exactly, but I want to say it, it's close to a hundred thousand. It might be more than that. Our advertising budget is in there. Advertising for like HR posting. HR and stuff. posting, uh -huh. uh, advertising. Um, there's a um, funding in there for uh, mentoring and coaching of new senior level staff. And there's also uh, some money in there. I think it's approximately $35,000 for uh, some additional support around the student management system or Aspen system. Okay. So Thank they've you. done they've done some um, some special program programming and data um, diving in there this current year, and they've there's budgeted funds to do additional to pull additional student reports off of Aspen. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, for capital equipment, I was bummed that the projectors didn't make it in, but I'm glad because of a snafu, but I'm glad that Fung and you have a plan to fix it. And I want to put in, I think it's a request for like the third year in a row to make sure that the projectors are in there because this is really so critical to the functioning and, and we really need to have them budgeted going forward. Um, special education, I have a question. Linus, do you mind sliding to that slide? Uh, yes, mm, is it this one? No, go to out of district, the next one. Yep, so we at the beginning of the year heard that there was going to be that 14% increase that the state had authorized in the memo in October. Um, and, I'm, and I would be grateful if you could explain why we aren't seeing those costs materialize in the actual request here. Um, so that actual 14% actually was, in fact, put in place by the OSD, um, and it's a real number. It, we budgeted that number. However, we have had, luckily, some things break our way. So there's been uh, some students who have who were in very costly out-of-district placements who are aging out. So because they're aging out, we obviously do not have to pay for them for next year. So the 14% the is very real. It's budgeted in here, but because of the change in some of the changes in placements and the students aging out, we're not, we're not feeling that pinch as if every as every student had stayed the same. Okay. So does that reflect a num the number of total students going down, or do we have other students coming in, but they are in less costly placements? Um, that may be a question for Lisa. I think she's here. I'm I I'm working with Tam too to see if we can like change the 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 tracking methodology to something that's a little cleaner than what's been used in the past. But I think that there, there's always fluctuations during the course of the year of students coming in and out, but there are some heavy, some students who are aging out that were in very costly programs. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question, and this relates to the same slide, the circuit breaker. It's sort of a follow on to Val's question, which is, um, I thought that what we heard last week in the, and I don't, this is, will re reflect my ignorance a little bit. I thought that what we heard last week was news that the Student Opportunity Act was fully funding special education transportation. So 
it sounds to me like that doesn't show up in our circuit breaker. So where does that funding show up in terms of assisting our budget? Because I've also heard that the state budget's flat for us, but if it's fully, in, I just don't understand how our budget is flat from the state if we're also getting our transportation fully funded. So the, the SOA money actually is rolled into the chapter 70 aid. And, and so it's funding the special education fully and I have to dig more into that, but that doesn't come to us separately. It's all, it all rolls into the um, chapter 78 that comes in. Okay, because it feels like if the state's directly funding something, we should see an immediate boost in our PSB budget. And so I'm still puzzled by that, but maybe that's a topic for town school partnership next week. Um, thank you for looking into it more. David, go ahead. On the operations slide, I noticed that there is a positive variance between FY23 and FY24. I understand that part of that is attributed to just the change in category of where we look at that uh, request. I'm wondering if there's another slide or some other place where we can see whether in the aggregates, regardless of category, it's an increase to the budget or if it would be a decrease. Do you want to go to the overall slide, which shows those categories overall? I think it's a couple back. One of the first ones. No, keep going, line us to the other direction towards earlier. Yeah. Keep going. Oh, you got to click through everything. Yeah. Oh, there. David, does this slide answer your question of it's almost net neutral for outside services and contracts? Yes, pretty close. Okay. okay, thank you. Was that your only question? Yes. Okay, Helen, go ahead. So could we go back to the tuition students and transportation, that slide that we just were on? <laughs> Linus's fingers are gonna get a workout. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so this is a follow-up actually to Mariah's question about the pie chart because it shows here the same way and I'm trying to understand it. So the tuition two is the outgoing money, the 7,396,000, right? Correct. The circuit breaker fund, isn't that the incoming money? So the circuit breaker money, that 3.4 million, that's revenue that we are going to receive in the current year. Right that we will expend to reduce okay. our tuition cost in FY24. Okay. So if we did is... not have that money. That oh, I know, I understand that. That I understand, that's not my problem. My problem is the total cost. Why yeah. is it an addition rather than a subtraction? Because if you did not have the 3.4 million, your total cost up above, would be 10 million, 10.8 million. But the issue, and I think Helen's point is that there should be expenses allocated to the different tuition so, like categories and special transportation. And circuit breaker shouldn't be presented here as a expense because it's really a revenue source. So our total expenses should be 10.8 million and the 3.475 should be allocated across transportation and the four tuition categories. Exactly, Yeah. exactly. Just because, as with the pie, I mean, the pie, it sort of helps you to see how much you're getting compared to how much you're spending, but. but it's, it's the same problem we had last year, which was we asked like there, there there's hidden, like the, it has to do, and I'm glad that you added in the ARP cost this year to show it as a whole program, Ruth, but it's the same thing here where there's actually other, like non-public schools could actually be 5 million, but a million of that is buried in the 3.4. And, you know, and again, across, there's 3.4, almost $3.5 million in costs that actually are allocated to the first five rows. But as exactly. I understand it, yeah, okay. And um, it may be for special ed services within the district. No, but the majority of circuit breaker we use for out of district transportation. I mean, out of district tuition, I'm sorry. Okay. And yeah, it would be helpful. Ruth, do you mind presenting at our next meeting a version of this which allocates the 3.475 to the to the five categories so we can see how it actually expends? Sure, not a problem. Thank you so much. Yeah. Helen, do you have any more questions or no, or... that was it. That was okay. it. Thank you. Other um 
other members of the subcommittee or full school committee or our advisory committee colleagues questions? Really? Wow. <laughs> Helen, go ahead. I can ask one other. There was one one part that was other on one of the slides that didn't. Too late, really... Helen. I stopped sharing. <laughs> uh, that's okay. You don't have to do it now. But at some point, can you just sort of let us know what other includes? I think it, I can't remember how much it was. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was other a... other. Um, it's that early slide which just breaks down the um, scroll up a little bit, Linus. It tells you what's in each category. If you go up a couple slides, oh, it does tell you. Okay, then I yeah, missed. it does. No, it's okay. Okay, go forget up. it. Forget it. No, it's helpful to look yes. at it. Do you mind, Linus? I think it's like maybe slide three or something. I don't know, but it describes slide each five, category. Linus. Five. Slide five. So other includes it. Those are the non tangibles. So other is mileage, uh, dues, conferences, uh, professional memberships, uh, subscription. Say that. You did say that. I'm sorry. Nope, no problem. It's a lot of information in a short period of time. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Linus. I dare you to take the slides down. We'll see if anyone else wants to <laughs> ask a question. Um, well, I want to thank you, Ruth, again for that presentation. It's really helpful. It'll be great to get the answers to the couple of questions that we had. Um, it is remarkable as well that even um, that the practice that you have are really looking at the practice that you described um, of how you develop the budget and going back to October and all of the things that were done early on to have people look at their budget um, sort of with a no assumptions, um, you know, uh, zero based budget approach is, is valuable. And thank you for talking through that and um, for what the result was in terms of being able to um, put together a budget that really has a very, very small um, increase, um, even in light of all the drivers that we um, heard about. So I'm grateful to you and to all the budget managers for, for doing that work. Thank you. Um, I just want to give a little bit of a preview of some upcoming meetings that are scheduled for people. So everyone has these on their calendars if they want to attend March 6th, which is next Monday. 3 to 4 p.m. is town school partnership. And we should be getting an update on uh, revenues. Um, I hear it's not great, but that was relating to some of these questions. It's odd to hear the news being trumpeted out of the state house about budgets, the, the state providing a huge amount of municipal support. And then what we're hearing is that locally it's not materializing. So, um, so more on that at town school partnership on Monday, 3 to 4. Um, that's a Zoom meeting. And then the 8th, which is Wednesday, a week from today, 5 to 7, um, the school subcommittee has requested a presentation um, from PSB, the initial presentation. That's also a virtual meeting. And then um, March 15th, which is two weeks from today, would be the next finance subcommittee meeting. And so hopefully we will come to some conclusions on the fees that we've been talking about. Um, as well as having a presentation on some of the personnel, um, on the personnel uh, details, a deep dive like we've done for non-personnel today. Um, are there any other meetings or anything else that people want to share with the group? Anything else that we should be aware of? Mariah, I'm sorry, what, what is on March 8th from 5 to 7? That's the AC Schools Subcommittee. They've requested a presentation. Okay. The, the, you know how there's usually at least in one or two presentations to them, followed by one or yeah. by two presentations to the full committee. Yeah. Um, so that's been requested for next week. I think the timing is very tight, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Go I, ahead, Helen. Yeah, there's also, I possibly, and I haven't heard anything for sure, um, the schools see, um, it's the CIP. Um, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I meant to ask uh, if the schools, I think it's on March 6th at, at six o'clock. Is that correct? Or 
Wait, so the CIP wasn't published. Are you saying that Capital Subcommittee of Advisory is reviewing the CIP? I went, well, unless it was published between last night and today. I looked, has check. anyone, I haven't Let looked me. today. Did the CIP get published? I haven't seen it. Has anyone seen it? Maybe. <laughs> Matt? Linus, have you seen it? Matt, anybody? Never. Okay. I have not. I, I, I was talking with uh, Charles Young in, um, in the town earlier today and he was working on getting the, the budget book out so if it's it might be rolled up in there i haven't had a chance to take a look usually it's a separate presentation to select board and it wasn't on their calendar for last night um i'm just looking real quick at that web page to see if it's if it's there now on the budget central okay, page so it's not march there 13th i take it back march 13th he's saying okay. 6 p.m March I mean, and, and that's not for sure that okay. he's just questioning that availability of people to be there. Well, the CIP is not posted yet. So, yeah. okay. And Mariah, I think just for, for broader context uh, for this audience, um, the when we're talking about the governor's budget in chapter 70, we were ever hopeful that we would see some big increases here. Um, but our understanding is that 45% of Massachusetts uh, communities received less than uh, 2% and 2% increase under chapter 70. And we are one of those fortunate communities. So uh, the, wow. some of, some of the committee members know that uh, we know that our initial town allocation was 127.3. That was then reduced to 127.005. And it's actually gone down by another $2,000 or so. So, so, we're, we're, we continue to move in the wrong direction for this budget season right now. So um, we'll keep our fingers crossed and ever hopeful, but it's not looking pretty right now. Linus, is that a done deal or is that does that number keep moving? Well, I think, you know, there's still revisions to come out and uh, the House budget and those types of things. So we're still, we're still early, but that's not the trend or the pattern we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. We'd like to see it eking in the other direction, not going in reverse. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for providing the updated dollars, Linus. Okay, we have the ability to end seven minutes early to undo the tragedy of our last meeting, which ran late, <laughs> unless anyone wants to add anything to today's meeting. Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you all so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. And we will reconvene as a meeting, um, as a subcommittee on the 15th um, and with the other events that I mentioned before then. Thank you, bye-bye.